Welcome to Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. In John 14.6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Our goal is to encourage everyone to grow in the Christian faith by anchoring themselves to the secure truth found in the inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word of God. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit and when I rise. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before, and you lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Psalm 139, verses 1 through 6, New International Version. Hello, welcome to a special episode and series of Anchored by Truth, brought to you by Crystal Sea Books. I'm Doug Apple, the manager of Wave 94 radio station in Tallahassee, Florida, and I'm going to serve as the guest host for this series. In the studio today, we're going to hear from an attorney from Orlando, Florida, James O. Cunningham, who's written a fascinating article for Substack entitled, History Doesn't Repeat Itself, But It Rhymes. Jim is joining us today because we wanted our listeners to hear Jim's observations about critical issues that will affect the upcoming elections. Jim is going to help us see that faith, culture, and politics are really inseparable, and it's essential for faithful Christians to understand how they intersect in today's postmodern, truth-averse culture. As longtime Anchored by Truth listeners know, we believe that there are four lines of evidence that demonstrate that the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, and infallible Word of God. We term those four lines of evidence reliable history, remarkable unity, fulfilled prophecy, and redeemed destinies. First, as both science, archaeology, and human historical records amply demonstrate, the Bible is historically reliable. Second, the Bible displays a remarkable unity for a book that was composed by over three dozen human authors who wrote over a span of 1,500 years. Third, the Bible gives evidence of supernatural origin, especially through a large body of fulfilled prophecy. And the fourth line of evidence is that the Bible has resulted in an untold number of lives that have been positively changed by its transcendent message. We strongly believe that the Christian faith is a faith that is grounded in evidence, logic, and reason. Contrary to the refrain that you hear from some people that, quote, you have faith, but I have reason, we believe that a proper use of logic, reason, and evidence actually demonstrates that the Christian faith is true. So today we're going to hear from someone whose life was transformed and redeemed by the scriptures, and as you will hear, after his life was transformed, Jim went on to intentionally develop and deepen his faith so that today he can help others see the truth contained in the Bible. Jim has recorded several of his observations in a series of Substack essays. One of the great things about Jim's observations is that they are packaged in a very convenient way. They're easy to read in just a few minutes, and his style is very reasonable and informative for the average lay believer. One reason that's true is that Jim has been practicing law in Florida for nearly 50 years, has been board certified by the Florida Bar as a civil trial specialist for 40 years, and has been recognized as a Florida super lawyer for well over a decade. So let's welcome Jim Cunningham to Anchored by Truth. Jim, you recently authored a Substack essay entitled, History Doesn't Repeat Itself, But It Rhymes. In your article, you address several topics about the current political, social, moral, and faith climate in America. We want to know why you selected the title for the article, but first, please tell us a little bit about your personal background and how you came to be interested in writing about subjects where morality, faith, and politics meet. I'm originally from the state of Wisconsin and attended Florida State University, where I was a member of the FSU track team. Turns out that a pretty co-ed from Jacksonville named Joyce Dickinson was on the FSU women's track team. 
And Joyce and I met on the track back in 1972, and she was a very fast runner, top 10 in the nation in hurdles. But after six years, I was finally able to catch her, and we were married. I graduated in 1973 with a degree in marketing from the business school and then enrolled in Rollins College, where in 1975, I received a postgraduate degree from the Rollins College Crummer School of Business. And then in 1975, I enrolled in law school and graduated from FSU College of Law in 1977 and began a legal career as a civil trial lawyer in Orlando, Florida, where I still maintain an active caseload. After Joyce graduated, she became a a CPA and she worked for one of the big eight accounting firms, Price Waterhouse, and later for Walt Disney World. She transitioned from her career in the office to her calling in the home after our first child was born. And Joyce and I have been married for nearly 50 years, and she's fond of telling people it's been 10 of the happiest years of her life. And we have three adult married kids, two daughters and a son. We have 10 grandkids, ages 1 through 11. And when we all get together, wonderful chaos is what we call it. In 2003, I graduated from Reformed Theological Seminary and received a Master of Arts in Biblical Studies. My friends tell me it was only because of my keen legal mind that (laughs) I was able to cram two years of intense theological study into just 14 years. In 2012, I was offered the opportunity to teach Barry Law School courses, and I taught courses in trial advocacy and the foundations of law. And it was while teaching the Foundations course that I rediscovered the enduring importance and relevance of the Declaration of Independence. And it still very much influences my thinking today, particularly as it relates to the areas of where human rights and politics intersect. Before we discuss your essay, what was it about the Declaration of Independence that was so impactful to you? Well, Doug, the first reason was that the Declaration expresses the Founders' shared belief in the theological origins of all human life and all human rights. It says, as we all know, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal and endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So first and foremost, The main reason I find the Declaration compelling is its statement that humanity has a creator. We are not an accident. We are not a molecular mistake. We are not lucky mud. No, we were created on purpose for a purpose. We were made by someone for someone. Some believe that the five most important words in the world are, in the beginning, God created. These are, as you know, uh, the first five words of the Bible. In 1776, these words expressed the unanimous belief among the signers of the Declaration, namely, that human beings are created by God and they are endowed by their Creator with inalienable human rights. Nowadays, it seems that these five words are very controversial, but even the atheist philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche understood the concept of human rights asserted in the Declaration does not have its origins in nature, No, it has its origins in religion, as Nietzsche himself said. Another Christian concept, no less crazy, has passed even more deeply into the tissue of modernity, the concept of the equality of souls before God. Nietzsche said this concept furnishes the prototype of all theories of equal rights. British author and one-time atheist G.K. Chesterton agreed, saying, America is the only nation in the world that is founded upon a creed. And that creed is set forth with dogmatic and even theological lucidity in the Declaration of Independence, which does by inference condemn atheism since it clearly names the Creator as the ultimate authority from whom these equal rights are derived. I think nowadays, Doug, many would be surprised to know that the leader of the modern civil rights movement, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, affirmed the faith of the founding fathers. In 1965, during a sermon at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Dr. King affirmed the faith of the founders saying, you see, the founding fathers were really influenced by the Bible. The whole concept of the Imago Dei is the idea that all men have something within them that God injected, and this gives them uniqueness. 
There are no gradations in the image of God. Every man, from a treble white to a bass black, is significant on God's keyboard precisely because every man is made in the image of God. And what King was saying in his own way is, before this God, all lives matter all the time. Even Joe Biden, President Biden, touted King's views when, in speaking to the country during a nationally televised address, President Biden said, My fellow Americans, America is an idea. It's the most powerful idea in the history of the world. Biden said it's the American creed. The soul of America, said the president, is defined by the sacred proposition that all are created equal in the image of God. That's interesting. Well, what are the other two reasons you found the Declaration is still so important? The second reason I find the Declaration so relevant is that it speaks against claims that modern America has somehow moved beyond the wisdom and truths embodied in the Declaration. For example, President Calvin Coolidge spoke on the 150th anniversary of the Declaration saying, about the Declaration, there is a finality that is exceedingly restful. He said, it's often said that the world has made a great deal of progress since 1776, that we've had new thought and new experiences, which give us a great advance over the people of that day, and that we are right to discard their conclusions for something more modern. But that reasoning cannot be applied to this great charter. Coolidge said, if all men are created equal, that is final. He said, if they are endowed with inalienable rights, that is final. Coolidge concludes, no advance, no progress can be made beyond these propositions. And anyone who wishes to deny their truth or soundness, for them the only direction they can proceed historically is not forward, but backward, backward towards a time when there was no equality, no rights of the individual. Those who want to proceed in that direction cannot lay claim to progress. They are reactionary, said Coolidge. Their ideas are not more modern but more ancient than their revolutionary fathers. The third and final reason the Declaration is still so important relates to our politics, to our democracy. Today, many appeal to the Constitution as the controlling document of our democracy, but our founders never intended for the Constitution to be interpreted in a vacuum. Long ago, the United States Supreme Court affirmed the interdependent relationship between the Constitution and the Declaration. They said, The Constitution is the body and the letter of which the Declaration is the thought and the spirit. They went on and said, It's always safe to read the letter of the Constitution in the spirit of the Declaration of Independence. So the views and the values proclaimed in the Declaration are the bedrock upon which the United States Constitution was later erected. And so whether it involves our courts reaching legal decisions or our legislatures enacting laws, it's always safe and advisable to read the letter of the Constitution in the spirit of the Declaration. And let me say that differently. Any movement that would turn the hearts and minds of Americans away from the Declaration of Independence towards the Constitution as the only source of our human rights is always unsafe and unadvisable. That's an interesting introduction, helpful context, but why did you entitle your essay, History Doesn't Repeat Itself, But It Rhymes? Most of us have heard the homespun wisdom that history repeats itself, and those who refuse to learn from the failures of the past are doomed or destined to repeat them. In fact, history rarely, if ever, repeats itself exactly. But as author Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it rhymes. What he was saying is that it doesn't exactly repeat itself, but if you look carefully, if you pay attention, you're going to find that modern events, issues, or conflicts are often very similar. They rhyme with past struggles our nations had in very important ways. We have something to learn, lessons to learn in the pages of history. And the key is to look for recurring, underlying themes, particularly where widespread conflict is involved. If we want to understand how we got here, we need to understand our past. You see, that for all our technological and scientific progress, one thing has not changed, human nature. 
we still have the same longings and desires, and we still struggle with the same fears and temptations. And for that reason, we would be wise to re-examine our past, to take the time to reflect on patterns between events from our past and those that are similar with our cultural or political events in the present. And if we do, we can often learn from the pages of history. We can often learn how our nation's past failures and errors rhyme with our current struggles. It can help us to connect the dots. It is unwise to simply dismiss the past as irrelevant to today's issues. And further, we will never see how events from our past rhyme with modern day events without an understanding of the Declaration of Independence. Can you give us an example of how history from our nation's past rhymes with modern events of today? I think we need to go back to the 1850s, and most historians will tell you that America was in turmoil. The moral issue dividing the nation at that time was slavery. The country had been torn apart by the Dred Scott decision, an 1857 U.S. Supreme Court decision that held that black slaves were beings of an inferior order, so much so that they had no rights, which a white man was bound to respect. And these legal conclusions were rooted in the belief that black slaves were not fully persons. Against that backdrop, Abraham Lincoln ran for president against Democrat Stephen A. Douglas. Lincoln opposed slavery while Douglas was pro-choice. Douglas argued that whatever states wanted slaves, they had the right to choose, saying, if any organized political community, however new or small, would enslave men, neither any nor all may interfere. But Lincoln, Lincoln's politics were anchored in another viewpoint. He said, I've never had a feeling politically that did not spring from the sentiments embodied in the Declaration of Independence. Lincoln understood that America was not founded upon the shifting sands of a political truth, but on the bedrock of an unshakable theological truth, that we are all created equal, that we are endowed by our Creator with unalienable rights, that among these are the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Back in 1860, when Lincoln ran against Douglas, theological differences divided the candidates and the country, and they still do today. So you're saying that there was a theological divide in 1860 over slavery that rhymes with a theological divide in our time. In 1973, the nation was again torn apart by a U.S. Supreme Court ruling, this time a decision legalizing abortion. Dr. Alveda King, niece of the late Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King, sees a link, a connection between the issue of slavery and that of abortion, saying, Abortion and slavery are evil twins, born of the same lie. Both are symptoms of a fundamental error. Both spring from the lie that certain human beings are not fully human. This lie corrupts our minds into believing that we are right to treat others as we would not want to be treated. Theological differences remain at the heart of what divides America today. Another example would be a podcast in January 2021 where House Speaker Nancy Pelosi criticized pro-life voters saying, Donald Trump, I think, is president because of the issue of a woman's right to choose. She accused pro-life voters of being willing to sell the whole democracy down the river for that one issue, saying, Their votes cause her great grief as a Catholic. Pelosi has said she believes in the dignity and worth of every person. Once referring to undocumented aliens, she said, We're all God's children. There's a spark of divinity in every person. So when do human beings acquire this divine spark? According to Nancy Pelosi's Catholic Church, at conception. As President Barack Obama said, quoting Dr. Seuss, A person's a person, no matter how small. But former Secretary of State Hillary Clinton disagrees. Clinton said the unborn person does not have constitutional rights. And as we know, Doug, during one shameful period in this nation's history, neither did black slaves. It seems Secretary Clinton has forgotten America's founding principle. The right to life is not given by the Constitution It is given by God. 
in his day, Lincoln said, the real issue in this controversy, the one pressing on every mind, is the sentiment on the part of one class of people that looks on slavery as wrong and of another class that does not look upon it as wrong. Today, the real controversy is between one class of people that looks on abortion as wrong and another class that looks upon it as a right. In a day when slavery was thought by many to be their right, Lincoln said, if slavery is wrong, you cannot logically say that anybody has a right to do wrong. Lincoln's reasoning applies to abortion. If abortion is a morally neutral obstetrical procedure, not unlike the surgical removal of a gallbladder, well, then, of course, the pro-choice position is correct. But if you admit that abortion is wrong, you cannot logically say that anybody has a right to do wrong. In Nancy Pelosi's words, President Lincoln risked selling the whole democracy down the river over that one issue. And I will guarantee you that Americans, especially the descendants of black slaves, are very, very grateful that he did. It is in these ways that history doesn't repeat itself, but it certainly rhymes. Jim, if people want to read your essay, where do they go to find it? The essay, History Doesn't Repeat Itself, can be found at my Substack account, which is located at www.jamesocunningham.com. We'd really like to thank Jim Cunningham for being our guest on Anchored by Truth today. I think we can all be inspired by the kind of reasoned approach that Jim uses to address issues that are of vital importance to life and liberty in today's culture of constantly shifting and changing morality. Jim's story is just one more example of how sacred scripture, the Bible, continues to demonstrate its supernatural nature through lives that are changed for the better for all eternity by its saving power. Today, for our closing prayer, how about if we pray for renewal of the church in our nation? 2 Chronicles 7.14 tells us that the Lord says that, quote, If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sin and will heal their land. A prayer for the renewal of the church. Righteous and just Father, you know the thoughts and meditations of your people as no one could. You are the Lord of our hearts and the fulfillment of all of our ambitions. You have numbered the hairs on our head, so you certainly know when we propose to do your will and when we don't. Lord, there are a great many faithful followers of yours in our nation today. There are many whose hearts are totally devoted to you and who want to see your kingdom come and your will be done. Yet within your church, we believe there are many who have been tempted by the snares of the world and a great many who have fallen prey to the evil one. We are saddened and grieved by this, and we yearn for restoration and renewal of the church in our land. Lord, if this nation is to survive and remain a land where people may freely worship you, we acknowledge that it will not be done through or by our efforts. Only the Holy Spirit can change the hearts of our countrymen, and we believe that he will act only as we persistently and continuously pray for renewal to come. Words do not do justice to the longings within our spirits to see this nation be visited by another great awakening. As you have done in the past, bring light to your people. Let us learn to handle your word properly and then bring it to the world by Christ's power, through Christ's love, and praying continuously in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. We hope you'll be with us next time when we'll continue our discussion with Jim, and we hope you'll take some time to encourage some friends to tune in to or listen to the podcast version of this show. If you'd like to hear more, try out crystalcbooks.com where we're not famous, but our boss is.